This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast for everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level. You came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of Shanghai, China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and the International Man of Mystery. My co-host is John Pasden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki. Sinosplice.com and aggressively unfancy. On this episode, I took the chance to ask John how he got to where he is with his Chinese Chinese that is so good. I once offhandedly asked him the word for puppet, and he instantly knew it. And later, what if you could have begun learning Chinese as a kid? I interviewed Caitlin Lee, who graduated from a Chinese dual immersion school over ten years ago. Her story blew my mind on how learning a language can impact your life, and a story for anyone who wants their child to learn a second language. All this and more. Let's get to it. All right, welcome to our podcast today. My name is Jared Turner. Hey guys, I'm John Pasden. John, what age did you start learning Chinese? Uh, let's see. It was my junior year of college, so I guess twenty. Age twenty, okay, but but your story I know is a bit interesting because you didn't start learning Chinese at the beginning. You were learning a different language. Okay, so in high school I learned Spanish for like four years. I did not know that. Yeah, it was AP or not? Sorry, IB. I also took the AP test, but、uh, Spanish. So IB requires four years of a language. But by the time I started college, I was tired of Spanish. You know, classroom Spanish. And so I wanted something different to fulfill my university language requirement, which you only need one year of. And so I wanted something exotic. So I thought, okay, Asian language. And the school offered Japanese and Chinese. So I was like, all right, those sound cool. I'll choose one of those. And so I researched it a little bit, and I discovered that oh, Chinese has tones. That sounds hard. <laughs> so that's why I、It、chose、is. Japanese and not Chinese.、Oh, okay, but why did you get so interested in Languages. I mean, okay, you've been studying Spanish. You must have had a thing for language. I know now you have a thing for languages, but well, actually, what, was, what I, spurred that? I didn't have a thing for language when I was studying Spanish. I just was pretty good at it, and I didn't hate it, but I had to study it. And my experience in high school did not ignite a passion for languages. So when it came to Japanese, I wasn't studying it because I had a passion for languages and I wanted to be a polyglot. I was doing it because I was tired of Spanish, and I wanted something interesting. And so I started learning it in my freshman year, and it went pretty well. It was very different, but you know I found it interesting. I did quite well in the class, and then I had this opportunity to go study abroad, and there was a scholarship and everything. And like my mom always had these fond memories of studying in Italy、um, as a as a college student. She spent one or two semesters in Rome. Oh wow!、And、so I just had this idea that oh, studying abroad is a good thing to do in college. So I thought, okay. If I can go study in Japan my sophomore year, I suppose I should do it. Well, your parents then. Well, your mom at least she had studied Italian, I guess. Yeah, both my parents studied Latin, French, and my mom also studied Italian. Okay, so there there is a bit of a bilingual, trilingualism in your family. I, they,、so、they studied it. I didn't say they can speak it. <laughs> there, there is a difference. <laughs> they studied them.、Uh, yeah, so、uh, I went to Japan my sophomore year. And I loved it. I stayed with a homestay family. It was exhausting, but the experience of learning a foreign language in that environment and communicating in this language that was once so foreign, and you know, it's slowly starting to make sense, and you know, you can actually have real conversations. Yeah, I loved it. Well, how old were you at this point? I turned twenty while I was in Japan, nineteen and twenty. Nineteen and twenty. Okay, so you're nineteen, twenty, living in Japan, homestay family. You were there for one year. Yep, one year, and then you came back to Florida. You're in you, you were from Florida, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the second half of the year, when I really started to get fairly fluent, I, I was realizing that oh, my microbiology major, like I'm planning to go back to UF and study、uh, organic chemistry and all this other stuff. I, I didn't want that anymore. I wanted to study languages. But、um, also, while I was in my second semester, I met some、uh, Taiwanese friends. And I was always intrigued by Chinese characters, and I just got it in my head that you know China is is really pretty interesting, and、um, I really enjoyed Japan. The culture is really interesting.、I、had a great experience, but at the same time, I was thinking, 
the society is kind of rigid and well defined, and I know what my place will be if I go and live in Japan after I graduate, and I want something different, a little. <laughs> Looking back at it, more chaotic or <laughs> uh, dynamic. Maybe. Dynamic. That's the word. <laughs> yes, dynamic. So I I started forming this plan while I was still in Japan that I would start studying Chinese after going back to UF. And then after I graduated from University of Florida, I would go to China and teach English and study Chinese. But you know, only stay for like a year or two. Oh yeah. After I got you know、Let's、some degree of、out. fluency, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and then move on. And I actually was also interested again in、uh, picking up my Spanish. I wanted to go to South America and you know have adventures in the Amazon and travel know, the world. Yeah, that that latter part never really happened. Well, I mean, you have. Well, my adventures have been mostly in Asia. Well, adventures in Asia. You could write a book about that. <laughs> When I went back to the University of Florida and I started studying Chinese, it was actually a lot easier for me than for you know the average white kid because、uh, I had this background in Japanese. I I knew the structure of characters. I was learning characters, you know, as building blocks for writing the language, but they weren't unfamiliar. I knew most of the characters already. Real quick for our listeners here. And a little bit for my curiosity too. Explain that relationship of Chinese characters with Japanese characters. So about a thousand years ago, the Japanese started importing Chinese characters and mapping it to their own language. So this was not the modern Chinese that is in use today, but the Chinese of a thousand years ago. They were taking the characters and they were assigning them to you know Japanese nouns, Japanese verbs. And so, a lot of the characters that are commonly used in Japan are also commonly used in China, but often in not quite the same way. So maybe when they imported them, some washed overboard and didn't make it to the China. Yeah, it's a they terrible just, joke. They just don't map well, you know. Interesting. Oh, but but they're not. Some of them have been like altered too, right? All right. So just to give a few simple examples, the word for person "ren" in, in、uh, Chinese, right, is the same character in Japanese. It's the same. All right, easy.、Uh, but then another character like、uh, "kan." And、uh, Mandarin meaning to look at. In Japanese, they don't use that character for to look at. They use miru. It's the word for、uh, the character for jian, like kan jian.、Hmm. So it's obviously related, but it's not the same character. I've got an interesting tangent story about this. This is fun. You'll like this. All right. So once I met this guy here in Shanghai. He had lived in Japan for maybe ten years, and he spoke an advanced level of, of Japanese. And、uh, I had one of our books. I think it was a Secret Garden. He was thumbing through it, and he's like, "Oh, actually, you know, I know these characters in Japanese." And so he proceeded to read the Chinese book in the Japanese language and translate it into English. So he's reading he's reading Chinese characters as they were as if they were Japanese and translating it like kind of in real time. And it was amazing. It was actually. You got the gist of the story, I, but there was—I I don't know which characters were—but there was continually some word that was continually translating into like atomic. <laughs> so it wasn't—it was kind of humorous, but you—you you got the gist of the story, and it was really interesting. Well, that's the way that Japanese people study Chinese. You know, they recognize all the characters. There's a Japanese pronunciation for all of them. They mostly get the meaning, but you know, it's not entirely there. But for me, it was really helpful because I could not worry about the characters too much. While everyone else was learning them for the first time and really struggling, I was like, "Oh yeah, it's just those characters." And so then I could really focus on tones and pinyin. And to be honest, I didn't do a great job with those, but still, it was a lot easier at the time. You must have、uh, you, you caught some traction early on, obviously here with the characters. That that sounds like that really helped you. Yeah. But what also carried you forward? Well, I had the plan all along to go to China, so. When you start learning a language with the goal of moving to the country and living there, it's a little different, right? So I, I was very focused on practical Chinese. You know, I knew when I was being forced to learn these like classical poems as part of first year Chinese that I didn't really care about that, and I just had to study it for the grade. But you know, I was focused on the practical stuff. But where did you study your Chinese at? You, you said you went to China to teach English, but were you just studying on the side? Did you have a teacher? Were you part of a program? So I studied for three semesters at University of Florida, and then when I went to Hangzhou, which is where I first went when I went to China, I got a job as an English teacher in a university.、Um, I had a minor in teaching English, 
And I basically spent all my free time studying Chinese. I had, you know, a paper dictionary. <laughs> This was before the smartphone revolution, I'm afraid. Yeah, I had a paper dictionary. I actually took it everywhere I went. And I had this notebook. I was writing down all this vocabulary that I thought was useful. I was pretty obsessed. So I would just seek out people that looked like they wanted to talk to me but didn't speak English. <laughs> uh, because, you know, my students wanted to speak to me in English, and I was very good about only speaking to them in English and not using them for Chinese practice because, you know, I was an English teacher. But on my own time, I don't want to practice English on my own time. On my own time, I was talking to Chinese people in Chinese. So I was talking to guards. I was talking to, you know, waiters. I was talking to uh, IE that cleaned the building. They were not trying to learn English from me for the most part. They were just interested in talking to a foreigner and surprised that I could speak any Chinese. And my Chinese was embarrassingly bad. My pronunciation was way worse than I realized. But um, yeah, it set me on my way. Well, I think that's pretty, that's pretty great because, uh, John, you'll have to forgive me what I do know about you. I, I, I imagine that that was a big step outside of your comfort zone. <laughs> I, I, I refer to you as a, a high-functioning introvert. <laughs> That's pretty accurate, yeah. So, I mean, for you to go out and just randomly talk to people, I, I, I imagine that was a big step no, for I've, you. I forced myself to do it. I remember I kind of saw it as this, um, like this alternate reality. Like, it didn't feel real. Like, I'm in China, and I'm talking to Chinese people in Chinese, and they're understanding me and speaking to me back in Chinese, and I'm understanding Chinese. It just felt so surreal. And so I was able to, like, almost pretend like it wasn't really me or it wasn't really real, and, like... We're having this conversation. It's and it, I was just saying anything that came to mind, and it, it didn't really feel like me. And I was able to do that for quite a while until my Chinese started getting better. And then the better my Chinese got, the more introverted I became in Chinese because I was starting to approach the real me in Chinese. I, I know that feeling. I I I think it's liking it to like you know going to a Halloween party with a mask on. You know nobody knows who you are, right? And somehow your some of your inhibitions are down, right? You, but I think as you progress on, I've noticed that too. It's like you approach the real you. Yeah, and it's just not as embarrassing uh, how bad you are when you just don't know how bad you are, and you know <laughs> ignorance is bliss. <laughs> yeah, you, you you don't realize why what you're saying is you know so culturally awkward. You're just talking and talking, and you know your intentions are good. You're not being a jerk. People can see that, and so you have conversations, and you just keep getting better and better. You know, I had uh, I talked to um, someone before where they had spent uh, probably four or five years learning Japanese, and and actually had done a lot of trips to Japan. And um, on one trip to Japan, they decided that, well, I'm actually going to go ahead and go to Taiwan. And, and he was actually interested in possibly learning Mandarin. And so he had just maybe started studying for like a month, just, just, just offhand. He could just say some things like ni hao. And so he, he, was, he was like a week in Japan. Then he went to Taiwan for like three or four days. He said for him, his experience was just like night and day. In Taiwan, when he just even tried to say simple things, everyone was just like, oh, wow, your Chinese is so good. Or, wow, that's so amazing. You can say these words. They were just so encouraging. And for him, that contrast between in Japan, he just felt like it was really hard for him to make a connection with people. And so after that one experience of going to Taiwan, he's like, that's it. I'm changing. Did you feel like uh, people are more uh, Chinese speakers were more encouraging about you learning the language versus Japanese speakers? Yeah, more encouraging, but there's definitely the uh, the aspect of like it, you're such an oddity, right? Mm. So it, it gets annoying, right? Because all you have to say is ni hao and people flip out, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas in Japan, uh, you know, I was in uh, Osaka and Kyoto and foreigners speaking fluent Japanese wasn't that crazy anymore. Mm. And so I would still get people praising my Japanese for just saying little things, but I, it wasn't to the degree that I saw in China when I first moved to China, like in Hangzhou in 2000. Yeah, that was kind of crazy, the amount of praise you got showered on you for saying anything. I, I have a great experience <laughs> once that sticks out in my mind about this. We, I was with a friend. We were traveling to Wudangshan. So if anyone knows it, it's more inland. It's a tourist location in China, but like no foreigners go there. It's one of the holy mountains, the birthplace of Tai Chi. We are up in this area. We're hiking up the mountain, and along the mountain, there's like these little restaurants uh, where you can order some noodles. And my friend I was with, he spoke very good Chinese, but he just ordered some noodles. He's like, you know, I just want a bowl of noodles. 
And this guy was sitting in the table next to us, a little short stool and, and on this low table, and with a mouthful of noodles like dripping out of his mouth. He's like, Why <gasps> He's like, You can speak Chinese. You can speak Chinese. And like these noodles are just falling out of his mouth on his lap. <laughs> and just like, I just started laughing. It was hilarious, you know. But I think it's some of the areas where there's fewer foreigners of, in China, they're just they're amazed by that. And why it's kind of it's kind of funny, you know. But it's in some way, you know, it's it's endearing and encouraging. I, th- I think a lot of people ad- admit this that even though it's like really annoying when people are constantly praising your Chinese, deep down we actually like it because Chinese is is not the easiest language to uh, you know to make uh, a lot of progress in. So uh, it's kind of nice to be encouraged, isn't it? Have you seen that Mama Hoo Hoo? Uh, I was thinking of the same thing. The same thing? Okay. We'll have to put this in the show notes, but I'll describe <laughs> it. It's so good. It's, it's, uh, what, what's the title of this video? It's like when you move, uh, like when you move back home after living in China or uh, something. I totally forgot. We're going to have to look it up. Okay. But, but what it is, is these two guys, you know, they've lived in China for a while and they, they've moved back home. They're like living in New York. Right. And, and they're just walking on the streets and they pass like two girls or something speaking Chinese and they're like, <gasps> They're yeah, so at first you think they're like pervin on the girls or something, but it's not about that at all. Not at all. The girls go to a restaurant and they so they sit in the table next to them. They're speaking Chinese and talking about this or that. And the girls they kind of notice them. They keep looking away, and and finally they end up like on the waterfront there in New York. And uh, and the girls like want to take a selfie or something. And so the guy's like, oh, well, can you buy me a pie? They take. He's like, okay, you can help us. And then the girl says like, oh, need a Zhongwu bu cuo. And they're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> And they're just like, euphoria sweeps over them. And they're like, your Chinese is good. They were just waiting to hear that. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I have a I have a WeChat animated GIF for that. Uh, I made that. You made that? I made that one. I, it's the clip from the video. It's, so, I mean, it's a little sticker on WeChat. I sent that one to you. So you're welcome. No, you didn't. I did make it. <laughs> and even I know the guys who make those videos... I sent the gift. I sent the sticker to him because I'm like, dude, I, I made it. They sent it to it. me. No, they didn't. <laughs> I made that. Yeah, I, don't, I don't remember where my gifts come from. <laughs> you get all you get all the good ones from me. Okay. Now a word from our sponsor. One of the most effective ways to build fluency is by reading in the language you are studying. It gives your brain the context it needs to understand how everything you are learning works together. To do this, you need Chinese books you can read. If you haven't already, check out the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series with Level 1 using only 300 basic characters. You'll find easy-to-read novels in Chinese based on stories you love, like Sherlock Holmes and Journey to the Center of the Earth. Buy them today at mandarincompanion.com or on Amazon. So, John, what's really pushed your Chinese? I consider you to be near native level. I don't think you consider yourself that to be, but you're pretty dang good. I remember once asked you the word for puppet, and you're like, "Oh yeah, I don't even remember what it is. What is it?" Whoa. Yeah, see there you go. I mean, who's going to know <laughs> puppet, right? You do. You're like the walking dictionary. Well, I know the difference between me and a native speaker, but you know, yeah, you're pretty good. I'm pretty, I, good. I'm pretty advanced. But what was the question? So what's what's propelled you on to having an advanced level of Chinese? You know, originally I was just planning to get kind of fluent in. Japanese, get kind of fluent in Chinese, kind of tour the world and, and kind of figure out a career later. So it wasn't until I'd been in China for two, three years when I started thinking, you know, maybe I want to stay here and I know I want to study linguistics. Maybe I actually should do that in China. And so I then did end up doing my uh, my master's in second language acquisition in China. One thing led to another and then I'm working at Chinese Pod. I'm starting my wait, wait, company wait, wait, wait. teaching Chinese. You, you did your master's in China, in Chinese linguistics, but you did the master's degree in Chinese. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now that couldn't have been easy. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> for you. <laughs> well, I had been in China for a while at that point. How studying, long? Studying pretty hardcore, about five years. Okay, all right. So five, five, but, but still, I mean, you had to write a thesis. Yeah, yeah. In Chinese? Yeah, it was like 80 pages. All right, yeah. Oh, be 80 pages. I mean, I, I don't know if I can write an 80-page paper in English. <laughs> oh, you can. Oh, I'm sure I can. It is a bit of work, though, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how did you get through that? I mean, obviously, you're encountering characters and concepts and stuff, which are, I mean, they're probably even new in English for you, but now you're also learning them in Chinese. Well, a lot of it was linguistics, and I'm interested in linguistics, and I had studied it a bit. Um, it's actually not that hard if you're studying some science to map Chinese vocabulary to the science. 
I can't really get into this in too much detail without using lots of examples, but um, it's not actually that hard. It just it just takes a little bit of time. And then it doesn't help that the uh, grad school experience in China is a bit more traditional than what you'd be expected to do in, in say, the U.S. There were some classes where we had to do like presentations, and and that was kind of a nightmare. Like I had to talk about uh, Chomsky's syntactic structures uh, in Chinese and present it to the class. Oh, that sounds fun. Oh yeah, that was probably the hardest thing I did in, in the program. But most of the time, it's just like, oh, you have to read this reading for class, and then you have to come and listen to the professor lecture, and you know. Anyone can do that. Pretend to read it. <laughs> Come to the lesson. <laughs> Nor normal college experience. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I did actually uh, read most of the stuff that interested me. Um, In Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. The thesis was, was, was kind of rough because I also did an experiment uh, related to mastery of tones. So I had to do the experiment, and then I had to analyze all the data, and then I had to uh, write the thesis so that was that was rough. Now the thesis. Now I, I you don't write our books. We have writers write those. Yeah. And I'm certain that you didn't go the thesis all alone. Now don't. I, I also did use more than 300 characters. Yeah, it would be very very good. But I'm sure you didn't do this thesis all by yourself, or you had someone helping a little bit or so editing. I, I had a good friend um, who I met uh, in my class, and he did me the huge favor of like checking my paper. That was probably a big job. Yeah, and that friend is now the editor for a major uh, educational publisher in Beijing. You know why he is? Because he edited your paper. He got some good practice. Actually, he did also look over some of our early Mandarin Companion books. Who's Zhang name? Pei is his name. That's right. I Shout out to Zhang Pei. Yeah. All right, Zhang Pei, you're the man. Thanks. He's awesome. Wow. Pull back the curtain a little bit because even you're not a native speaker of the language, and it's not just easy to write a paper, a thesis paper. You still need some support and help. Yeah, but one thing that I noticed uh, when it came to writing the thesis, because I remember when I started the program, I was thinking, man, how am I ever going to write this? Like, I had worked on my writing quite a bit because I had to pass the university entrance exam, which has a writing component, a big writing component. It's also handwriting. So that that was rough. Uh, but I, I had worked on my writing quite a bit. But, you know, writing a thesis, that's like a whole new level of daunting, right? But after having read so many linguistics papers, that input, right? Just over and over, like the, these words and phrases, they, they start to stick and you don't even realize that they're starting to stick until you're sitting in front of the, the computer and you're starting to type and these like whole phrases and sentences just start coming out. And it's like, whoa, like, I, I didn't know I could use that. It's because you've seen it so many times, right? You need the input before you can match it with the output. You know, that just matches so much stuff that I always tell Chinese teachers of that, you know, their kids, you know, they're having a hard time on the test or they're having a hard time on writing portions, especially the AP Chinese test. That's a big thing these days. And it's like, well, if your students, you know, if they can't even read, you know, sit down and read for 15 minutes or even 30 minutes, what makes you think they're going to be able to sit down on a two-hour, you know, AP Chinese test and, and, and pass that? I mean, you build up to that, right? You didn't start your program like, oh, I'm writing a thesis at the very beginning. No, it was a two-year program? It's actually a three-year program. Three. So you, you pretty much had two years in, I imagine, before you really got started on writing on that thesis. Yep, yep. So, yeah, it's something you build to. Yeah, my studies had all kinds of different uh, levels. And, you know, before it was uh, reading graduate level readings for my for my master's, it was like uh, working with uh, news and uh, reading lots of Chinese news stories and translating them into English. So, yeah, it takes lots of input to get to an advanced level. What would you say was a period in your life where your Chinese now became a competent level? Well, I remember that quite early on in my studies, after about two, three years, I started to get really cocky. Like, I thought my Chinese was so awesome. I was really only intermediate level. And, you know, my tones weren't perfect or anything like that, but I thought they were pretty awesome. People were always complimenting me about how fluent I was and I could talk about this and that. But actually, my vocabulary was not very big. And my Chinese was not amazing. And I think one of the things that it took was I was thinking like, oh, I could probably pass the highest level HSK, right? Mm. And I could not. Like, I had a, a ways to go both in terms of grammar, anything formal, and a lot of vocabulary. So I had reached kind of, you know, like a certain milestone because I was confident and I could have conversations about, you know, all kinds of everyday things. But it would, it would be a while before I really got to the next level. And where are you at now? <laughs> uh, 
Well, I started this company that trains people in Chinese, and one of the reasons that I wanted to do this was because it means that I read Chinese all day, every day, to help my clients in Shanghai. And the topics range from things like current events to IT to design thinking to financial markets. I'm always learning new stuff, and I hope it's always like that. I can't say I'm always interested in all of it. I'm just yeah, constantly learning, and to be able to to do that, I think is is pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Well, I still remember the day meeting you on the bus. <laughs> Not this again. <laughs> yeah, why, why is this even relevant? Because it's a fun story. The day we met John, it was such a memorable day. I was I was a China noob, and I met you. I was on the bus. What well, was a uh, Joe Shaliu, right? Bus ninety six out of yep, yep. Zhongshan Park. There. Yep. The only seat left on the bus was next to John and sat next to you. And I'm kind of like trying to talk to you. And then I'm like, oh, I just came to Shanghai. You know, I felt like prepubescent teenager or something. And uh, and you were this China veteran and you spoke Chinese. And I'm like, oh, wow, I want to learn to speak Chinese. I'm, I'm learning. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, kid. Right, kid. <laughs> but uh, it, it's kind of interesting in life. We learn, we grow, we progress. And you got to start somewhere. And one of my favorite sayings is, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is right now. Yeah. And so for all you listeners out there, if you are uh, 12 years old or 62 years old, you can still start learning Chinese. It's a very learnable language. And the good news is the characters aren't really changing too much anymore. So yeah, <laughs> That's true. They're waiting for you. So get to it. My name is Caitlin Lee, and I am born and raised in San Francisco. Just upon hearing her name and knowing she speaks Chinese, what might you think she looks like? You'd be wrong. Um, kind of the interesting thing, since um, your listeners can't see me, is that even though my last name is Lee, I'm actually um, Caucasian. Well, I guess that's not terribly unusual. What is unique about you, Caitlin? Yeah, I grew up speaking Chinese um, starting from when I was four years old. So Chinese is kind of my first and a half language, you could say. <laughs> first and a half language? You've got to hear about this. Stay tuned. Tell us a little bit, like, where is your current level of Chinese right now? I would say I am very fluent in Mandarin. Well, I did see somewhere that you had posted you are your HSK 10. Yeah. Um, that, I, I didn't know that was a level. I, I think they, <laughs> those are the old levels, right? Because it goes up to six these days. I'm so good. I'm off the charts. They made a new <laughs> level just for me. Um, yeah, so back in the day, back when I took the HSK test, um, there were, I think, 11 levels. And so I was level 10 when I took that test. That was about 10 years ago now. That was before I worked in China for three years. So I feel like my Chinese definitely improved in some ways since then and probably kind of got a little worse in other ways. So I don't know what I would get if I took the HSK test now because it tests for really specific stuff. Um, so like some of my classical Cheng Yu and stuff is probably really terrible compared to when I was a student. Well, uh, well, Caitlin, tell us a little bit then about, um, about your experience learning Chinese. So you said you started learning Chinese when you were four years old. Um, I grew up in San Francisco. Um, we had a public Chinese immersion program um, at the elementary school in my neighborhood. So it was an opt-in program. It started in kindergarten. Basically, the way they did it was they more or less just throw you into the pool. So the teacher only speaks in Cantonese. And um, so it was Cantonese immersion. So we just learned it by being in the environment. That was basically my school environment starting from kindergarten and continuing all the way through fifth grade. So so wait a second. So you, you first started studying Cantonese, is that right? Yeah. So, but there, so there was no Mandarin? No. So I studied Cantonese um, from 
kindergarten to fifth grade. Um, and then when I was in middle school is when I started learning Mandarin. So in middle school, it was a K through eight school. We operated more like a typical middle school. Um, most of our subjects were in English. Um, so we had one class of Cantonese, one class of Mandarin, and the rest of our classes, science, math, history, what have you, that was all taught in English. But middle school is when I had those subjects for the first time in English. Well, that's fascinating. Had you started learning characters at that point? Yeah, um, actually, I couldn't even read English until I was like nine. Really? Yeah. I mean, so so you're talking about this dual immersion program. It was like all Chinese. Is that right? Yeah, my recollection, um, and I was a kid, so, you know, maybe I'm not totally accurate, but when I was in kindergarten, I don't really remember any English. I think that there was something like maybe an hour per week of English um, and it wasn't our normal teacher. It was like like a volunteer or somebody who came in and did English. And then in first grade, I think we had, you know, maybe, I don't know, an hour a day or something like that in English. And so each year we would get a little bit more English instruction until fourth and fifth grade. It was more or less half English, half Cantonese. When you're a kid, like the way you grow up is just mm -hmm. the normal way to grow up, right? Like all kids grow up speaking Chinese and like having their classes be in Chinese. And um, I just didn't really think about it at all. Um, and even when I got a little older, even in middle school, when I knew like, okay, this is different from other kids. It really wasn't until high school when I met kids who went through more of a typical um K through eight experience that I realized that like, first of all, they thought I was super weird. Um, and second of all, um, that I had grown up in a very special kind of environment. Well, tell me then about your classmates, uh, you know, the ones you, you attended school with. Uh, were they mainly Caucasian kids like yourself or were they uh, you know, American born Chinese kids or, or, or what? Um, I would say it was probably about half kids who spoke Chinese at home and half kids who didn't. Um, our class was pretty small. It was around 20 kids. And um, the kids who weren't Chinese speakers, there was a Korean kid, there was a Peruvian kid, there were a couple black kids, there were like two Caucasian, three Caucasian kids. It was a real mix. One of the kind of cool things was that because our school was optional, um, it wasn't, you know, the assigned school, um, we also had a lot of kids from other neighborhoods. And so you didn't have like only the rich kids or, you know, only the poor kids. But a lot of people saw it as a really cool opportunity to get their kids out of the neighborhood that they were in and get them a really good education and learn another language. So why did your parents decide to put you in this program? So it was really this weird kind of lucky, serendipity, crazy thing. I have two older brothers, and my oldest brother is eight years older than me. And when he started kindergarten, he just went to the neighborhood school, right? Like, you don't know what you're doing. You just say, where does my kid go? And they go, right? Christmas time rolls around. My kid is in, or my brother's in kindergarten. Uh, my dad, who's kind of, he's kind of a big guy. He's got a big beard. Um, he gets asked or volunteers or whatever. He's Santa Claus for all of the kindergarten classes at my brother's elementary school. So he's going around and um, dressed as Santa. He goes to my brother's class. Like kids are screaming. It's chaos. Teacher seems overwrought. He doesn't have a lot of confidence in it. And he goes to a couple of the other classes, isn't feeling super good. And then he goes to the brand new first year ever Chinese immersion class. Hmm. Kids are sitting cross-legged quietly. Teacher is very engaged. Kids are learning a new language. And he's like, that's it. Switching my kid. So he switched <laughs> my brother in. Um, he was super, um, my parents were super happy with the teachers um, they thought it was great for kids to learn another language. Both of my older brothers went through the program, and I went through the program also. 
Wow, that's really neat. So you you just mentioned earlier that uh, you found out as you got a little bit further on in school that there were many other students who went to more traditional schools who had a very different experience than you. How would you, what were some of those key differences that you uh, had in immersion school versus kids who went to a more mainstream school? I would say like it was culture shock. So Mm. for me, I grew up um, where Chinese culture was kind of the dominant culture in my school. Like the cool kids were all Chinese kids. We all had kind of um, shared experiences in Chinese culture the you know one of the club activities after school was fan dancing so i did fan dancing and we would all go and get like gai mei bao and like cha su bao at the um you know at the chinese bakery right like there were all of these chinese cultural experiences that i grew up with that were just totally normal like getting licey at chinese new year i'm not even chinese but my parents like did it anyway because all of my friends get red envelopes and i wanted one too right <laughs> So I grew up with like this total immersion in Chinese American culture. And uh, like I knew other kids didn't go to the same kind of school, didn't learn Chinese. I knew that, you know, but I didn't really know it, know it. So when I started meeting kids who, um, for example, went to some of the private schools in San Francisco where it was almost all Caucasian and very affluent, it was a huge culture shock for me because we just didn't have a lot of the same cultural reference points. Um, And they thought it was really weird that like I knew these things, was interested in these things. They were like, are you trying to be Chinese? Like, do you want to be Chinese? And I was like, this is just who I am. This is just how I grew up. Like I wasn't expecting kind of pushback or scrutiny about the fact that, that I spoke Chinese, that I, you know, knew these things that I liked to eat dim sum, right? Like this is, (laughs) this was not something that I expected to be a difference between me and other kids. And it was, you know, and I grew up with, um, you know, in the school I went to, there were a lot of kids of different kind of backgrounds financially, a lot of kids who came from immigrant families. It was just very different going to high school and being around um, kind of a set of kids who, you know, may have grown up in a totally different socioeconomic sphere in some ways as well. Now, for what I understand, the high school, it, you still had Chinese classes, but it wasn't an immersion type program. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so I went to a public high school in San Francisco. Um, It's called Lowell High School, and it's um, basically like the magnet public high school there. And so they offered um, something like eight foreign languages, of which Mandarin was one. So then how you said there's a big culture shock going to a high school that wasn't an immersion school. Um, So what were some of those key differences that you experienced? You talked about some of the cultural things, but even like schoolwork, what were the the main differences that impacted you? I think it had more to do with my classmates and like their education approach or their education background being a little different from mine than necessarily the teachers. Probably the thing that, that really bugged me a lot in high school was that every time I went to a new Chinese class, it was like a big deal, big production. Like, are you sure you're in the right class? And then they would like, look at me. (laughs) Has everybody looked at their class schedule and knows they're in the right room? And then they'd look at me, right? Because everybody else is Chinese and then there's like this one white kid. And it was super embarrassing, right? And of course, as a teenager, you're more sensitive. Um, and you're just like, everybody was looking at me. Um, (laughs) and so, um, you know, that really bothered me, the distrust, the distrust that I belonged there, that I knew the language. And then, you know, the flip side of that, the distrust of why I would know the language and why I would Mm. be interested from my peers. So it was a weird experience. Um, and, you know, uh, growing up in the immersion program, Teachers all knew me, knew that I spoke the language, right? Like it was never a question. And my classmates also all knew me and just knew it was normal that I spoke the language. And so it was never a question. So I think that was one of the things that really 
bothered me when I went to high school was that kind of the weirdness around it. Other people thought it was weird. Both teachers and students thought it was weird that I spoke Chinese and that I was good at it. Well, did did things change at all as the years went on, or the semester or two? Did did you kind of get to know your fellow Chinese classmates? I would say some. It's a very big high school, so every semester、um, I had new classmates and a new teacher. So by you know the end of it, I think I was starting to have repeat teachers who were like, "Oh yeah, I remember you."、Um, <laughs> And a couple of teachers also had known my brother, who went to the same high school, and so they could、mm. see our last names and kind of go like, "Oh, yeah, that other white kid who spoke Chinese, right?" But it was、mm. still such a new thing that it was,、um, you know, it was still a huge surprise to them. And I think that that has totally changed now, because there's so many、um, people learning Chinese at a younger age.、Um, so I don't think it would be shocking to anybody now. But at the time, it was like the one kid in the whole high school of I don't know twenty five hundred kids who was taking Chinese but wasn't Chinese. That's interesting. How do you think your experience differs from kids in Chinese dual immersion schools today? I don't know. I think that、um, programs have definitely gotten even more robust. So、um, I haven't looked at a ton of other schools, but I've kept in touch with teachers from the school that I went to, and now they have like a Guzheng Orchestra, and they have all of these like really like Lion Dancing Club, and all of these really great enrichment programs that、um, let the kids experience Chinese culture and. Um, you know, a lot of that stuff we didn't have because it was so new、um, when I went through it. So, I mean, from that perspective, I can definitely see it getting much more robust. But other than that,、um, I don't totally know. I mean, it's definitely normalized. So, I think that that's a great thing. And I think that kids today, when they you know go forward in life, they're not the only one who's learning Chinese who isn't Chinese, right? Like, there's a huge interest in learning Chinese、um, all over the world. And so, I think that that's a huge difference,、um, where it's totally normalized. There's lots of support. There's tons of Clubs and like podcasts, like this one, and all kinds of things、um, for Chinese language learners.、Um, whereas, you know, a couple, you know, a decade or fifteen years ago, that really wasn't so much the case because it just wasn't quite as popular. So, what about now? You know, you you've gone through that entire experience of learning Chinese, and it sounds like your experience is very different than the traditional Chinese learners. And in fact, a lot of times I ask people, saying, "You know, what were some of your breakthrough moments? What were some of those aha moments、uh, in learning Chinese?" I mean, did you even have experiences like that? Not really. Sometimes I feel like kind of a fraud because I get a ton of credit from people, like, "Wow, your Chinese is so good!" And I know how hard other people work to get to a really high level of Chinese, and I really didn't have to work hard. Um, so sometimes I feel a little guilty about that, but I do like I have a couple of memories. Like I remember、um, being really nervous before I started kindergarten because I knew that the teacher would only speak Chinese and I didn't speak Chinese. And I remember my brothers being like, "It's gonna be okay, you'll be fine. Like you'll learn it. Don't worry. The teacher will make sure you know what to do." <laughs> like I have this very vivid memory of talking to my brothers about that as you know a pre-kindergartner. Um, and then I remember before going into first grade being nervous because in first grade was when the school implemented the rule that all first graders and up, if it's during school hours and it's not during recess, you cannot speak English. So in the classroom, we could not、wow. speak English at all,、um, or that was you know、uh, you would get punished for that.、Um, wow. And so. I was really nervous about that because I remember thinking, like, what if I can't do it, or you know, what if I can't say what I want to say? So I remember being nervous about it,、um, but it was never a problem. So、wow. between kindergarten and first grade, I basically became fluent for the purposes of what I needed to operate as a six-year-old. So I think that's interesting. You're saying that for you, Chinese never was hard. It's not something that you feel like you really studied. Not really, no. I, I mean, I hate to like make everybody hate me, but no.、Uh, 
Not really. It wasn't something that I consciously had to learn in the way that you learn a foreign language. So as an adult, I took a couple Korean classes and I was like, oh, <laughs> I get it. This is really hard. It's hard to put your brain into thinking it in a different way. And when I transitioned from Cantonese to learning Mandarin, it was a little bit hard because a lot of the sounds in Mandarin don't really exist in Cantonese and don't necessarily exist in English. And so my mouth and like my tongue and my throat hurt for like the first couple of weeks or so. But it wasn't like the kind of struggle that learning a language is when you're really learning it for the first time as an adult. Well, what was that experience like transitioning from Cantonese to Mandarin? So like as kids, we always used to make fun of Mandarin because we thought it sounded really snooty. So we would like, <laughs> we would be like, shua, 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 you know, and like make fun of it. Uh, and then we got to <laughs> middle school and like had to learn it. Uh, so it was humbling. Um, but, um, basically we, it was, it was basically the same method. So they had a teacher, um, who they hired, who was from Taiwan and only spoke Mandarin to us. We learned Bapa Mafa, which is like the Taiwanese phonetic, uh, symbols. So there's like a little mm -hmm. song, Bapa Mafa da -ta -na -la, that I can still remember. <laughs> um, so we learned how to do all of that, and I don't know, we were very comfortable within a year, I would say. Okay, so a lot of your learnings from Cantonese, or last year, language ability in Cantonese transferred pretty well over to Mandarin, is that's what it sounds like. Totally, totally. Like, the way that you write in Cantonese is the way that you speak in Mandarin. Um, mm. And so a lot of stuff transferred. Um, there's a lot of vocabulary is the same just like the way you say it you know the sound of the word is slightly tweaked or you know you can kind of guess like I wouldn't say there's a one-to-one -one. like it's not like everything in Cantonese that is C is like xia or something like that there's no one-to-one -one, but it was like close enough that after a year or so you kind of could like understand what people were saying in Mandarin even if you hadn't learned all of the words you could figure it out so it seems to, I, I occasionally I've met parents who are considering putting their kids in a Mandarin program, but they're concerned about the language being too difficult for their child. What would you say to a, a parent like that? I really wouldn't worry about it, especially the younger the kid is, the easier it's going to be. Um, the kid won't know any different. Like they won't know that they're missing out on like easy street and learning math in English, right? Like they'll have no idea. They'll just be like, this is my life. I do math in Chinese, right? Like they won't know. Uh, so yeah. I think the best thing you can do is have them learn the language when they're younger and it's easier. It gets really ingrained in their brains. Um, and I've also seen research that learning a foreign language um, when you're young can change the structure of your brain and give you a lot of benefits beyond just learning the language. I think the next thing I'd like want to ask you about is how has your Chinese skills affected your life after school? It has been super critical in my life. It, and, you know, your mileage may vary because both of my brothers also went through similar experiences as I did. Neither of them really uses their Chinese today. But for me, I've always been a language person and um, I love to read and I'm very people oriented. And so um, when I graduated from college, I ended up going to China for several years and working there. Well, what did you do there? And what did you do in China? Um, so I worked for a consulting firm that did government policy analysis and PR um, consulting work for governments and multinational corporations. And Chinese was, was critical for that. Um, and I have continued to use Chinese. So I currently um, work doing uh, kind of external relations and fundraising for an organization. Um, but my focus group is um, international, including a lot of um, Chinese folks. So I still use Chinese on a daily basis and talk to people on WeChat and um, help a lot of people from China with, um, you know, navigating things in the U.S. if they're having issues. Um, and so, uh, you know, I still use it every single day. Well, I got a question for you then. What if you could speak Chinese 
but you were unable to read. How would that have impacted your entire experience up until now? For me, it's kind of like saying, what if you only had your right hand and didn't have your left hand? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what that question is to me. So when I was a kid, I couldn't read English, and that's not typical of all of the kids in my class. So other kids in my class could read English just fine. So don't think that because you're in an immersion program, you can't learn English. That's not the thing I'm saying. I couldn't learn English. Um, and so I couldn't read till I was nine. I don't know if I had some kind of learning disability or what, but I could always read Chinese. I could always write Chinese. Chinese hmm. saved me from being the stupid kid. Hmm. So it saved me wow. from being the stupid kid in the eyes of, you know, my classmates and my teachers. My standardized test scores at that time were probably like a, like less than 10% or something abysmal, right? Because I couldn't read English. So I would just like randomly choose. Um, and I remember that. I remember doing like the annual <laughs> state tests and just like randomly choosing answers and sitting there bored because I couldn't read. But Chinese let me, you know, read books. It let me do all of the schoolwork and other subjects that I could learn how to do. So I did my math and my science and my history, everything in Chinese, right? Like I could keep up with all of my schoolwork until I was nine and some random switch flipped in my brain and I could read English. So for me, like being able to read Chinese, that was a lifesaver in a very real way. That is what let me be on the path of, you know, believing that I was smart, believing I was good at school, believing that I could succeed, right? If you're the kid that can't read until you're nine and you're like the outcast and you're always relegated to the remedial classes, I think that that has a detrimental effect for the rest of your life. So I was definitely saved from that because I had Chinese. So it was like, oh, yeah, Caitlin's smart. She just can't read English. So, you know, it was a big deal. In terms of just like general, like if you're learning Chinese and you're trying to decide, like, do I learn how to write? Do I learn how to read? There are some really, really great things about being able to read, right? Like it helps a lot with vocabulary acquisition and learning new words. Because if you understand the word huo, the sheng is the same as like the sheng in something else, right? Like Xian sheng. Right, like something else, right? Like you understand that the words have a meaning and that they connect to different vocabulary. Then you're going to be able to learn vocabulary more quickly, in my opinion. And when you get to the point of like, you know, two characters separately and then you see them together, you can kind of go like, oh, I get what that is, right? Like a uh, hua shan, right? You're like fire, mountain. What could that be? A volcano, <laughs> yeah. perhaps? Do you read books in Chinese? On occasion. Um, I do have two young kids, so I don't really do a lot of anything fun. <laughs> um, I love my kids. I still think that they're fun. But you know what I mean. I think I remember when I met you in Shanghai, you were actually reading a book in Chinese. Uh, what, what's your favorite book in Chinese, Do you have, if you have one? I do have one. I'd have to go look up what the name was because I got it from the library a couple of years ago, but it was super good. It was about the AIDS crisis in China. It's like the narrator of the book is this child who's murdered because their father was an official who like covered up the AIDS virus spreading through the blood that peasants were donating and then having re retransfused into them. And so like the whole village gets HIV. And so as revenge, they poison this child. And so the child narrates the book about like what is happening in the village as this like crisis is unfolding with the um, HIV infection. It's super good. I know that made it sound super just like dark and, <laughs> and, and it is, but it's a really good read. Mostly what I read is uh, like really, really cheesy teen books. Um, so <laughs> that's it. That's what I remember you know. That's what you want. One of those. Uh, I read this one <laughs> that was kind of like Twilight Light. So it is about this uh, girl and she's like a witch or something. I don't remember much. She had a boyfriend. He was really hot. There was a lot of good kissing. It was good. <laughs> it kept your attention. What is your Chinese superpower? 
Um, <laughs> my <laughs> Chinese superpower? Well, it's definitely not the power of invisibility. Because <laughs> anywhere I go in China, people definitely notice me. Maybe it's the element of surprise. Maybe. Ooh, that's good. What, do you have any funny experiences about that being in China and, and nobody thinks you can speak Chinese and so they're all talking and, and then all of a sudden you, you reply in Chinese? Do you have any funny experience like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so one time my um, husband and I, we were traveling. We were down in like Beijing. This guy comes up and my husband's half Chinese, right? So people always come up and start talking to him first because they think that he might be from like Xinjiang or something like that. But, but he doesn't speak Chinese, does he? Not a word. So they come up and they start talking to him. And like, it takes us a while to like clue in that somebody's trying to talk to us. And he was doing like a survey or something like that. And so I turn and I go, oh, like he doesn't speak Chinese. And then the guy goes like, oh, like you speak Chinese. And so we get to talking and I'm like, so, um, you know, where's your jiaxiang? You know, where are you from? And he says he's from Guangdong province. And so I said something and like, this almost never gets into me because I don't like to freak people out. But I just like said, you know, oh, you speak Cantonese and Cantonese, something like that. And he literally shrieked and jumped back. <laughs> like, I've never seen anybody do this in real life. It was a total cartoon reaction. He shrieked and he jumped back. So maybe you're right. Maybe it's the power of surprise because I had quite an effect. Yeah, it's, it's been really great to hear about your experience. And uh, it's, it's totally unique. Um, because right now, you know, there's, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids in dual immersion programs all over the United States and in other countries. And it's great to get your perspective on someone who's gone through that and is now on with your life and career. Any, any advice you would have to offer someone uh, who's studying Chinese? Um, I would say, you know, just keep at it. Um, if there's any way, try to go to China and just get immersed in the language or any other way you can get immersed in the language. That's really the best way. I didn't get truly comfortable in Mandarin until I lived in mainland China. So I would say even for me, even with my Cantonese background, that's what did the trick was being immersed and living there. So I would say that's the ultimate if you can manage to swing that. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, distant relatives, pen pal, your Uber driver, in-laws, postman, dentist, and that one guy named Steve. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner. And I'd like to thank my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Passon. See you next time. <laughs>